Okay, um, so now I'd like to introduce Justin Williams from Sam Houston State University that's going to talk uh, about an intriguing title to me that, as a botanist, uh, the breakpoint of botanist. I'm ready to break. All right, well, I'm going to be a little nervous here because I just finished this slide show probably about five minutes before this uh, session began. Also, I'm uh, used to talking to undergraduates who don't come in here with uh, preconceived ideas and uh, potential criticism, so, <laughs> so be soft on me, all right? Anyway, so let's just jump into this. What is the botanist effect? So a paper that was written about 12 years ago by this Mormon and Esther book, uh, kind of the botanist effect that counties with maximal species richness tend to be home to universities and botanists. And in their argument, they're basically saying that species richness is highest in counties that have a university with a botanist. Again, suggesting that the species richness is high because botanists are out there collecting species richness. But then, uh, so yes, Norman Nesterbrook demonstrated for 80 year variant distributed throughout the United States. Uh, the plant species richness was highest in counties with their variant and significantly lower in neighboring counties without their variant. Calling this the botanist effect. As soon as this paper was written, maybe about six months later, there was a rebuttal to this argument here. This is the botanist effect revisited plant species richness, county area, and human population size in the United States. And in this paper, uh, Patasso and McKinney argue something uh, rather different. What they argue is they argue against the botanist effect, instead demonstrating that higher species richness is positively correlated with human population size. Their suggestion humans are driven to settle in areas with higher species richness. And we understand this because humans tend to settle in ecotones, right? You get the best of both worlds, <coughs> uh, surf and turf. So, you know, when people settle along the coast, right? One day I have lobster, tomorrow I can eat a steak. So again, we do see that humans are driven to areas with a higher species richness, and it's understandable. Problem is, is I would argue that they're both making a mistake here. Uh, and the mistake is that botanists do not collect species richness. Instead, what are they collecting? They're collecting specimens, not species richness. So again, you have this circular argument here, this chicken and egg. So like I can say, how best to address the chicken and egg? The phenomenon in question is calling the botanist effect, and the data used to support this effect is species richness. So again, repeat botanists do not collect species richness, and instead they collect their various specimens that are in turn used to calculate species richness. So again, we're all familiar with the very famous curve, the collector's curve or Preston's curve, but if you need familiarity with it, basically it just shows that each of these are, these are for the, each of these dots is one uh, of the counties in Texas, 252 counties. And we uh, looked at here the number of herbarium specimens and species ratios. And again, you see that right for each county, as uh, herbarium specimens increases, the knowledge of species richness increases. So again, herbarium specimens are more uh, species richness are more of a function of collecting of herbarium specimens. And again, we don't just go out there and collect species richness. Uh, so I would do it's more complicated like, than this. So I would show this sort of this diagram that I made here. Human population as human population increases, we can increase assume that higher population should have more botanists, and more botanists then are going to drive more herbarium specimens, more <laughs> floras. Uh, but also we can have amateurs that aren't necessarily technically called botanists. You know, they also collect herbarium specimens as well. And also some of these two, you don't have to be a botanist to write a flora. And all of this is driving towards our knowledge of species richness. All of these different lines here have run various regressions. There's a completely different cause, but this is for Mexico. You can see here, I did look at all the states in Mexico. And so we can see here varying the specimens. The more herbarium in the state, the more herbarium specimens. And that's obvious. Species richness values decrease with the accumulation of herbarium specimens. Again, we see this here too. Uh, but all herbarium specimens of the population, the larger the human population, the more herbarium specimens that are collected. Again, suggest that there's not only botanists that are collecting herbarium specimens. And I want to go through all of these. I will point out this one is kind of a reflective of one of the problems we have with conservation. And ultimately what this lead is leading to is uh, collector bias and data gaps is that what you do tend to find is that as area increases there is actually a reduction in the number of herbariums so we're not really kind of keeping up with our natural history collections in expanded areas which again accounts for this data gap uh, so and this is a paper that I wrote with a colleague of mine it actually came out a little bit before uh, Mormon and Estabrook's paper we showed the same thing except we weren't uh, clever enough to come up with a, with a uh, fancy name like the botanist effect. But, so not only what we showed in this paper is that indeed uh, species richness is higher in counties with herbarium, 
and versus uh, counties without a variant. But again, we showed something else, a different data set, which is again, counties with their variant, we're gonna have way more or variant specimens. So again, that's what I'm driving at is that's really, we should be looking at our variant specimens, not necessarily species richness to define this botanist effect. And so here's another one. This is for all of the 510 herbarium in the United States. I just looked at the herbarium. You know, you went to index herbarium. Uh, they report like how many botanists work there and how many herbarium specimens. And again, this would make sense. You run this, we see that as the number of botanists per herbarium increases, well, we can see the number of herbarium specimens also increases. All right, so again, I think I mean, my point here, the botanists are actually driving the collection of herbarium specimens. So, when addressing the botanist effect, it's perhaps best to evaluate our various specimens and not species richness. So what I want to test here is the botanist effect by measuring the proximal effect of herbarium distance on herbarium collecting. So I needed to locate a herbarium that had uh, geo-referenced their herbarium specimens. In order to test my hypothesis, if the botanist effect is an actual phenomenon, then the number of herbarium specimens should decrease uh, from distance from it as a distance from an herbarium increases. So here's Mexico. Mexico started off georeferencing way before almost any other herbarium did. Uh, this is, I don't know if you know Jose Pinero's dad. Uh, he's, a, he's a botanist at UT. His father was the president of Bacardi. So Bacardi generously helped to support all of this payment of this to georeference in these specimens. And so what I did here is I just isolated one herbarium, the one in Jalapa. So these are the uh, specimens from Jalapa. This I represents where the herbarium's at. And then what I did is I took uh, this intriguing uh, buffering 10 kilometer increments, and at each 10 kilometer decrease in increments, calculated the number of herbarium specimens. So we can see here, we start here, we go at 10 kilometers, how many herbarium specimens do we have? And so and then I plotted this out of what's called the piecewise regression. This piecewise is a tool that's uh, is useful when uh, studying independent variables that partition into clusters. And so the cluster would be close to a herbarium further away from herbarium. When the partition data is analyzed, the results of the piecewise analysis can identify the edge between different segments. This edge is often referred to as a threshold or breakpoint. So what we see here, this is the Jalapa data. And if you go here, we see that indeed, you know, the number, the maximum number of herbarium specimens is very close to the herbarium. But as we get further away, we see that the number of specimens drops. And using the piecewise, we see it at about 113 kilometers is the breakpoint for this particular herbarium. Uh, basically, we don't need this. Anyway, when you're trying to figure out this piecewise, what are you basically looking for the high and large square value with a very low significance of F here? But uh, so then I looked at four other herbarium, and again, see the same phenomenon that as we go, we see a break point distance. This is a weird one because this one's actually increasing as you get further away, but then we do see a, a decrease as we get further out. But overall, they're showing that the maximum number of specimens is closer to the herbarium, and it decreases as we get further away. So I looked at Mexico, Australia now, is, uh, uh, they have their specimens online, so I looked at uh, Melbourne herbarium, and again we can see that the maximum number of collections it has a break point here of about 188 kilometers. Queensland herbarium breaks at about 200 and, uh, uh, was it 32. Mississippi, uh, same thing, we went to Arizona, did three different herbariums in Arizona, looking at these uh, break points. And so ultimately, and then uh, what I did on this one is, this was not looking at individual herbarium, but this was looking at all herbarium specimens and all herbarium. So instead of this being just one herbarium incremental distance, I said, let's look at all the herbarium in a particular region. Let's look at all the herbarium specimens. So we can see here the break point's a little bit uh, smaller. So if we look at Mexico, we see a break point of herbarium specimens from all, I think there's something like, what was it, like 35 herbarium? I had data for it, it breaks about 62 kilometers in Oklahoma, about 100 kilometers, and in Texas, it breaks at about 80 kilometers in distance from the herbarium. If we look at all of this here, we can just see here that the range, individual <coughs> herbarium that I've looked at so far is 113 to 231 kilometers. Uh, but then if we look at the entire region, like I said, Oklahoma and Texas is a little bit shorter, about 62 to 106 uh, kilometers. But if we average this out, we see about 175 kilometers. And then I have looked at other herbarium I haven't shown, and they all kind of fall within this 175, 180 area right there as being a break point. So then, uh, so conclusions, data from numerous geographic areas, the sources confirm that indeed a spatial bias in herbarium collected exists. Well, we all knew this, but I was just more interested in finding out, is there a particular distance? 
And buying this dirty shop by his torch, collecting closer to their bear, and we, get, we understand why pressures of teaching, you know, money getting away, whatever. And then uh, the threshold distance they collected from our bear averages out to about 180 kilometers. But here's what's cool. So then, if you take all the herbarium in Texas and in Mexico, it's taken me a long time to map them all out. I'm trying, it's probably taking another, another six months before I map out every single herbarium in the world. But uh, that's, the, that's the benefits of not sleeping, right? And just being bored and having, you know, just nothing to do at night. But uh, it's in front of a computer at 3 in the morning. Uh, but so then if we do a buffer of 180 kilometers, we would then show that these shaded areas are without this 100 kilometer buffer, and then we could argue that this is where we expect to see our data gaps. And this is, actually I use this because for me, I, you know, I always tell my students, you can just as easily study plants that grow on the beach as you can in the desert. So I'm a beach guy. So I use this as an argument from my university to help pay for me to go hang out in Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> because again, Puerto Vallarta has very low expense. And, then, and since I started collecting there in the last eight years, I'm finding some extreme uh, disjunct between plants and Guatemala and everything else. So again, reflective of very little collecting here, but that's because there's no herbarium uh, nearby. But what's cool is I've done, like I said, I've done other type of, this is another paper, like I said, I did with my colleague. We looked at species area curves to isolate data gaps in, in uh, their bearing collections. And so right here, this is using a species area curves. The red uh, counties are the ones where uh, observed species richness approximates or exceeds predicted species richness. But what I'm actually showing here is that it, this sort of maps out the same as the data gaps that you have is just looking at the, uh, at the break point of 180 kilometers. And like I said, one thing that this could be good for is because when, you, when you're writing grants, well, you just can't say, hey, I want to live in Puerto Vallarta and look at plants. That's not going <laughs> to fly, right? But now maybe this is what one of the motivators behind this too is maybe giving some botanists and other individuals some sort of support as to why they need travel money to get away from their herbarium. Because now we can suggest, well, we do see that there is a significant drop off at this particular distance from our collections. And then, so uh, solutions, uh, we you know this, encourage students to collect and everything. That's not the thing. But for me, the bigger solution is to, what I would really argue is to redefine the definition of the botanist effect and not stick with how Mormon and Esterbrook was presented it as the botanist effect being the driver of species richness. Because here's the thing, what I'm looking at with this breakpoint in the herbarium collecting from a distance from an herbarium, we support that, yeah, that makes sense. Botanists collect your brain specimens, breaks at a certain distance. The thing that it does not answer is still this, which one of these guys is correct? We don't know. Maybe humans did sit on areas with higher species ratios, or maybe botanists are driving species ratios. The only way to really answer this is to, is to what, though? Is to collect way outside of that range and have, a, uh, have actual real collections that support our species ratios, and then actually have observed species richness you know, it would be nice that for every single county of, tech, of, of, of the United States, that's not going to work. But if we actually had real reportable observed species richness for every county, then we could maybe come and address the question, well, are humans settling in areas with higher species richness or not? But again, that's something completely different. But like, so this doesn't solve this problem. This is still an argument here. But again, I'm just trying to show that for the botanist effect, I think we should redefine it for our bearing specimens and not species richness and then get into the circular argument here. Uh, I'll end on this note. This is a quote I really like. This is the early suggestion of spatial bias. It was made in 1768 by this naturalist Gilbert White. I mean, he wrote, it is, I find in zoology, as it is in the botany, all nature is so full that the district produces the greatest variety, which is the most examined, which basically suggests that he understood the botanist effect about 200 years before the rest of us even put it down to paper. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>